Welcome to the Pueblo Army Air Base Museum. And it's so great to see you all here today because this is a special event. In fact, we had to import people for this event. <laughs> they came from Holland and other places, even Colorado and Ocean Springs. You know. So, um, but most of the people that came from Holland, now that's a little country in, uh, in Europe. And you know what they say by, by the about the Dutchman, so you can always tell a Dutchman, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, before I introduce the author of the book that is going to be presented this morning to the museum and the president and its, and its president, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the, the base of the things that happened. And first of all, uh, we have one person today with us who was here in World War II and trained on this base. There he is, right there. George Williams. He was a gunner on the B-24 during World War II, flying out of England. And I'm sure I see him almost every week, you know, he's flying over, but he never waved at me or anything. <laughs> he's up in that B-24 at 25,000 feet. But anyway, there were several other people that were with us for quite some time here in the base. And I want to mention it, just about four, four of them, <coughs> because they were very important in the development of the base, of the museum. And uh, the first one I want to talk about is uh, Mark Morris. He was also a gunner on a B-24. And uh, he was involved in the first mission on Polesti in Romania. And in fact, there was only 185 airplanes going out to Polesti. And during that mission, they lost 80, no, they lost 54 of them, unfortunately. And lots of them, some of them landed in Sicily and Africa, and that's where they started to, anyway. But only 33 of the airplanes that returned from the flight, from the mission, bombing the refineries in, in uh, Romania, only 33 airplanes were still serviceable the next day. So they were shot up so bad by German fighters and flak, and they, it was a low-level mission. And of course, the, the flak likes that, you know. They, pretty effective with their uh, guns. So Mark Morris, he, uh, he flew his 25 missions as a gunner and was returned to this base. And he became an, a gunnery instructor, teaching the guys how to shoot guns from airplanes. And although he returned from his missions without too many scratches. When he came over here, he got involved in a mid-air collision, and he had to use his parachute, but he survived that. So fortunately, Mark was with us to only a few years ago. He was a great guy, very effective, doing the work in the museum uh, and what all is involved in museum work. So that was Mark Morris. The next guy is another one, um, Alan Siemens was his name. And he was shot up over Germany during a mission to Berlin. And they lost two engines. Well, the B-24 didn't fly very well on two engines. So uh, they were losing altitude all along. And pretty soon they were down about tree height. So well, we'll never get to England this way. <laughs> we better choose to stay with these Dutch people. So they landed. They crash landed in northern in Friesland. That's a northern province in Holland. And uh, unfortunately, two pilots got killed. But he survived with five or six other guys. 
and uh, the underground also helped uh, high Allen Siemens in the basement here or there and uh, sure enough you know they said well we want, need to get you to the Pyrenees and uh, across Spain and you can get back to England and do some more flying for us. Well, unfortunately he got caught by the Germans in Belgium and off he went to a POW camp. So that was Al Siemens. Then there was Russell Dar, another great guy on the B-24. And he was only 19 years old and he was flying the right seat in the B-24. Wonderful guy. And he made the Air Force his career. He came back over here after the war and one mission he really remembered was the mission to Arnhem, trying to save the battle around Arnhem. And they dropped supplies. Unfortunately, some of them were dropped right in front of the Germans. So they didn't help us very good. But anyway, that was, uh, what's it called? <laughs> Russell Dar. Yeah. And he, was, he retired as a lieutenant colonel. The next, the fourth guy, was another gentleman, and his name was Davis, Bill Davis. He did a lot for the museum. He did a lot of advertising for uh, the dance we have in the spring. And uh, so he was always selling tickets for that type of thing. Unfortunately, he had a stroke not too long ago, and he passed away during one of those moments. And so that was Bill Davis. There was other fellows that are here. But anyway, I was always very impressed with these four guys and some of them I took up with myself went to soar over the Colorado mountains. But anyway, today we have somebody special, folks. We have somebody who worked three and a half years to write a book about the crash of a B-24 near his hometown. And he's worked hard at it because three and a half years and one book is still pretty good writing. I've been working on it ten years and I'm not halfway finished. <laughs> but anyway, his, his name is Mark Vendendries. No, my Dutch is good enough to pronounce it. But anyway, he's sitting right here. Mark, and he will introduce some of his Dutch relatives he brought over, and some of them will live over here. So I'll leave him to do that. Okay, Mark? Thank you very much. So good, mo good morning. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a very big honor to be here. Let me first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Mark van der Dries. I live in the Netherlands. It's a little European country between the North Sea, uh, Germany and Belgium. You might have heard about it. And these days I am a postal worker and in my spare time I'm a professional graphic designer. And uh, since, this, since this year I'm also an author of the book. I live in the province of Utrecht. It's the dark blue. Um, in the center, but I was born in the province of Zeeland, the light blue area in the southwest. Um, I'm on holiday in, now in the US, and I have been asked to tell you about an event that took place in Zeeland, the Dutch province where I, was, where I was born. World War II had a large impact on my family. <coughs> my grandfather, Father Lane, he, he on the wedding photo on the left, the father of my mother, was killed during an Allied bomb raid on the shipyard of the harbor city Flushing. My other grandfather, Piet van der Gries, the father of my father, he on the right photo, was a member of a local resistance group. But now I had a good relationship with him. My grandfather, Piet, uh, I've never really spoken with him about his time in the war. But one day, during a visit to my grandparents, he took my brother and me on a ride to a farm of his cousin Pierre. They told us that they 
have been uh, members of the resistance group during the war and showed, me, uh, showed us two large machine guns that once belonged to a crap bomber. Here you can uh, see three of them. And that was about uh, what I could remember. After my grandfather died in uh, 1992, he left my family a file with photos, documents, and newspaper clippings about the war. He had told my father quite a lot about the dangerous period in our history. And my father wrote it down for a paper that my daughter had to make for school. And one day, when I started to read my father's writings, and also study the documents and the photos in my grandfather's file, I became very interested, especially in the story of the crash of the American bomber near my grand grandfather's hometown. I began to search the internet and found much information, but it was fragmented and spread into little pieces across some web website and some dusty old books. After a long search, I managed to get in, co in contact with families of both the American crew members and the Dutch resistance fighters. And all these people gave me their little pieces of the puzzle. Some small anecdotes or photos and some complete written stories. It was my job to put all these stories into a, a chronological order and fill up the gaps with research. After a search that took about three and a half years, last year, December, my work resulted in this Dutch book with the translated name, Distress Call of New Zealand, the crash of an American bomber in a polder in Zealand. Let me tell you something, something about the place where it all happened. <coughs> the province of Zealand was once a delta, and consisting of a number of islands, and one part in the south that attached to Belgium, the low part. New, uh, New Zealand was named after this province, much of the area is man-made. In the Middle Ages, people began to build dikes around parts of the sea that they wanted to use for growing crops. After draining uh, with uh, windmills, the famous wind, Dutch windmills, they knew um, this new land became a very fertile polder. So the polder, in the name of the lecture, is a low drained piece of land surrounded by higher dikes. So this is the dike, and this is the, the polder. A large part of, of Zeeland was given its current size by clustering all these boulders to the islands. A small town called Heikensand lays on the, on the former island South Bay Bayblad, near the city of Goes. This town was once part of the sea and was created by monks in the 15th century. As you can see, uh, Heikensand consists of a cluster of several boulders. All these parts are all boulders. For the main part, it's an uh, agricultural area uh, famous for the apple and pear orchards. If you drive, drive through the rural area, you will see many dikes meandering through the landscape, planted on both sides with double rows of poplar trees. Many roads are on top of these dikes. Yeah. My family has lived in this area for ages. My earliest ancestor that I could track was born in uh, 1450 in the city of Goes, the same city where I was born. Here are photos of two of my great-great-grandparents, both in traditional dresses. In May 1940, the Netherlands were invaded by neighboring Germany. In Zeeland, this was done by German uh, airborne divisions. In those days, my grandfather was the head of a primary school in Heinz itself. This is a photo of his family just before the war. The boy on the left is my father. As soon as the Germans invaded Zeeland, a German unit was built up in the school that you can see on the right. And a German officer demanded a room in my grandfather's large house that you can see on the left. My grandfather had to learn to live with this new situation, but it didn't stop him from joining the local resistance group. This group was part of a larger organization called the OD. They did everything, they, uh, they did everything to oppose the invaders. They did some sabotage actions, hit people that had to, uh, to work in Germany, 
They made false passes and spied on the German fortifications. This information was published in the illegal newspapers sent by secret radio or smuggled to England. The local group consisted about, of about 14 people. The men in this photo are the men that, who are important for our story. From top to left to bottom right. The group was called the Group Griep, the group uh, named after their leader, the family doctor, Jay Griep. He was my grandfather's best friend. The other are for, former soldier and district commander Kovac de Steiner, in the middle, and his brother, younger brother, Pio. Uh, both owners of a, uh, of a, a large uh, a tree nursery. Bottom left, you can see their cousin Piet van Andries, my grandfather, and next to him, blacksmith and former soldier Nico van Wiesen, who was appointed a military commander of the group. As a soldier, Nico fought the Germans. He became a prisoner of war, but escaped and made it back home. For Allied bombers that were stationed in England, um, the Prophet Selov was on the route to the German industrial areas. First, the bombers were for British, bombing mainly German cities at night. And when the US joined the war, American bombers flew to Germany during the day to hit targets like airfields, shipyards, factories, and railways. That's why people in Israel were quite accustomed to see a lot of bombers in the sky, as you can see here, accompanied by escorted fighters. Uh, the British during the day and the Americans during the night, so it was all day through they saw these aeroplanes in the sky. Many were shot down by the German flag, and over 600 crashed in Zeeland. Because of this, the local resistance group were also quite busy for hiding the foreign airmen who bailed out and were able to escape their arrest. The British, American and Polish airmen were smuggled to Belgium and through France to Spain. This so-called pilot hell was very dangerous for the resistance <coughs> members. Um, airmen who were caught went to the prison of war camp and had, to, and had a good chance of surviving the war. But their helpers were shot as spies or terrorists. The American Air Force that flew from air bases in England was the 8th Air Force. These are the units of the crew that I want to tell you about. The 392nd Bombardment Group was later located at Reading Air Base, and the nickname was Crusaders. From 1943 on, the Crusaders flew with B 24H uh, Liberators, mainly escorted with B 51 Muslim fighters. So these are the, the units. The bomb group consisted of four squadrons. Uh, one, of the, one of the four squadrons was the 579th Bomb Squadron. And most of the time, the crew was named after the commander, the pilot, and in this case, this was Second Lieutenant Jim Guerrero. This is a liberator from the Crusaders, marked with a circle B on the tail. And the liberator had four, <coughs> four propellers and was armed with 10.50 Browning machine guns. There was a nose turret, a tail turret, a top turret, and a ball turret, all armed with two guns. The two gu other guns were in the, in the waist of the bomber, by two girders protecting both sides of the aircraft. In this picture, you can, you can also see this very bold uh, turret under the plane. Very visible. On most missions, these turrets were removed because it was the most vulnerable uh, place in the bomber. It was an easy target, and you wouldn't want to be stuck inside of it during your belly landing. You can imagine that. Maybe. Here are some liberators of the Crusaders in flying information. In April 1944, a crew was assembled around pilot Jim Garrow at this uh, air base, the, the Pueblo Air Base in Colorado. As you can see, the, the crew first consisted of 10 men, but the whole turret gunner was transferred to another crew. All the men were specialists and were to complete their own special training. And after their collective li uh, liberator training at Pueblo, they were shipped to England with the largest passenger ship in the world, the Queen Elizabeth. They were brought to Wendy Ar Army Air Base in the English district Norfolk, the home ba base of the Crusaders. This is a photo of the officers' mess that is still here. 
people from Puerto Rico. On August the 3rd, 1944, the crew flew their first mission. Early in the morning, they received their briefing where this map was used to England and Europe. Uh, they took, took off in the bomber that you can see over here, Algal. After assembling information, they flew over the North Sea to bomb a target in France. Because of heavy clouds, they had to search for a secondary target, the Flaken, Flaken Bridge, the car and train bridge that linked the former island South Bayland with the Dutch mainland. Here you can see an air photo made before the bombardment. You can see there the bridge. And here you can see an air photo made before um, uh, this, was, this was one uh, taken during the bombardment. You can see that the mission was successful. The bridge was so heavily damaged that the Germans could not transport cargo and men from, the, from and towards the former island of Zeeland for quite a while. Just before the bombardment, uh, bombardment a car with a wood burner drove over the bridge. Just when he had crossed it, the heavily shocked Dr. K. Sleep saw in his driving mirror how the bridge was completely destroyed. At that moment, he didn't know that a month later he would risk his own life to help two of the airmen who almost killed him that day. <laughs> Jim Garrow's crew flew their missions on both several enemy targets. You can see most of them in Germany, the one in France. While they were doing that, Kees Schiet was arrested by the members of the Landwacht, the strong arm of the Dutch NSB, the National Socialist Movement, that collaborated with the Germans. Here you can see a Landwacht uh, captured by the Canadian troops. Like most of the, of the resistance fighters, Kees owned a secret radio. He knew he was betrayed because the man from the Landwacht immediately walked to the closet where he had hidden the radio. The possession of a radio was a serious offense, and, had, and at least four men from Zeeland have paid with their lives in concentration camps, only for owning a radio. The case was imprisoned in Middelburg, the capital of Zeeland, and his house was confiscated. His wife and children had to move, to a, move in with a befriended family. The resistance group knew that they were in trouble. There was a list with the names of all the resistance men in the area in the office of Case, and now his home was used as a sleeping place for German soldiers. And on one night, this is the, this is the house of, uh, of the doctor, on one night, Nico van Biesen and a friend, Case Power, broke into the home of the doctor and stole the list under the nose of the sleeping Germans. The burglary was successful, but the resistant men had to watch their steps because he helped some people to hide in the smithy by making the blacksmith assistance and making false passes for them. Nico was closely watched by the Landwacht. They had arrested him a few times and he had to endure some heavy beating while being interrogated. But they couldn't find any proof of his resistance work. Because the 8th Air Force was... Uh Yeah, thank you. Because the 8th Air Force had managed to destroy a large part of the German air, uh, aircraft, factories and oil refineries, until now the crew had only encountered enemy ground fire from flag guns and saw no attacks from the enemy fighters. But on Monday, September the 11th, the crew was on a mission to Hanover to bomb an industrial area. There, they were attacked by fighters from the, for the first time. 20 to 30 Messerschmitt fighters, like these, of these on the bottom, oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, took the formation under fire for about five minutes. Tail gunner Norman Haber managed to take one Messerschmitt down, but that couldn't prevent that the bomber, the field of Atlas, was hit. <coughs> the radio operator Morton Baker was ser seriously wounded and three other bombers of the Crusaders were shot down. Five men died, the other managed to bail out. And during the mission, 30 men were wounded, 102 were missing, 10 liberators were lost, and 181 were damaged, two of them beyond repair. 
a few days later, on Sunday, 17, uh, September 17th, 1944, Operation Mark Garden started. Maybe you know this operation from the movie A Bridge Too Far, or from an episode of the series Band of Brothers. During this large airborne operation, American, British, and Polish divisions landed by parachutes or gliders around the important Dutch cities, Arnhem, Nijmegen, and Eindhoven, to conquer some important bridges while the British ground troops would advance from Belgium. The next day, on September 18th, these troops needed supplies, like ammunition, food, weapons, medical supplies, and things like that. This had to be done by bombers that had to drop supplies instead of bombs. They had to drop the supplies while flying at tree top high. The canvas bundles and metal drop containers were attached to parachutes. The crew of Jim Guerra also went on this same mission. Their drop zone was food back near Nijmegen. You can see the drop zone as a blue circle and the arrow pointing at it. Because their other bomber was damaged during the last mission, they had to fly with a bomber that was on loan from the 466 bomb group. This bomber was called the Feathered Indian. I made a reconstruction of the bombers that you can see here. I've also made a reconstruction of the nose art. At first, the bomb's name was no feathered engine, but because uh, one or more engines must have been feathered, because uh, during its 60 missions, the no was crossed and the feather was painted on the bald head of the Indian character. The bomb was developed by the Cons Consolidated Aircraft Corporation. It was made in the Fort uh, Willow Run Assembly Plant in Michigan. The wounded radio operator Morton Baker was in the hospital, in the hospital so the crew needed a replacement for him. This is an old crew, the old crew that flew the mission from the top left to low right. Uh, pilot Second Lieutenant Jim Garrow. Uh, Co-pilot Second Lieutenant Fred Fellarelli. Bombardier Second Lieutenant Joe Sikowski. Navigator Second Lieutenant Dave Brandon and flight engineer and top gunner uh, technical sergeant Jean Peters, tail gunner staff sergeant Norman Hebert, also known as Frenchy, and left waist gunner staff sergeant and right waist gunner staff sergeant Ben Green. The re replacement for Morton Baker was radio operator staff sergeant Elton Southwell, here on the left. During the mission, all bombers had a drop mask on board. Private Ed Gensho on the right from the cargo supply detachment was assigned to the crew to lead the dropping of the supplies. This was Ed's very first mission. When the crewmen had left the North Sea behind them and flew over the former island Pule over Plaque, the feathered engine was immediately taken under fire from flight. The engine was damaged, the one engine was damaged, and the propeller had to be feathered. And uh, on their way to Bruce they were hit several times. Because of that, the bomb bay was filled with gas fumes, and they had to open the bomb hatch to get rid of it. Here's a photo of the dropping of supplies. You can see the parachutes and the bundles coming down. This is a photo of an American soldier who was unwrapping the, the dropped bundle. And while the crew was under heavy uh, fire by the uh, many flag positions around the drop zone, the crew succeeded in dropping most of the cargo, mainly the ammunition. But, but they had to leave before they could uh, drop everything. Another engine was damaged and died before, uh, after a few minutes. Jim Garrow tried to stay in formation and flew back uh, on two working engines. When he saw the North Sea before him, he knew that he, he could not make it to the other side. And navigator Dave Grennan calculated another route to Brussels, uh, the capital of Belgium. And Brussels was already really liberated by them. So it was... Yeah. And while he was trying to get to Brussels, Jim noticed that the rudder cable was, wasn't working. So he gave uh, Jim Kiras the order to get to, uh, to the rear and to, uh, to fix it. He had just reached the, the rear, 
when the bomber was taken under the heavy fire by two German flak positions in the former island of South Vietnam. The bomber was hit in the bomb bay and caught fire. Because the bomber couldn't be saved, Jim rang the bell and gave the order to bail out. This is a map that the German flak unit made of the crash. The curved black, black line is the bomber. The B-24 didn't have a door, the only two exits were the bomb hatch and the rear and the rear hatch. Because everything happened at the same time, it will tell you what happened at the two exit hatches. This is the rear, the rear hatch first. Tail Gunner Norman was the first to jump and broke his ankle while landing in an apple tree. Um, when Waste Gunner Lloyd walked to the hatch, he saw the 19-year-old drop master Ed standing there. Ed was terrified and was afraid to jump at such a low altitude. Lois tried to persuade Ed, but the boy began to yell at him and kick him. So Lois had to make a different, difficult decision to bail out before it was too late. He jumped and landed in the workyard. Uh, the Liberator's nickname was the Flying Coffin because it had no door and the catwalk of the bomb bay was so narrow that a man could only cross it sideways with the front parachute, uh, without the front parachute. Engineer Gene knew he was in trouble. His parachute was in the front, but he was in the back at the bomber. And the bomb bay was on, the, on, was on fire and he couldn't cross it at the risk of getting burned badly. Where's going to be? Uh, ben told him to cling on his back so they could jump together on one parachute. They did, but when the parachute uh, opened, Gene slipped and fell to his death. He fell in front of some barns in, uh, uh, of this farm behind the sun. I think he must have dropped here. This place. Several witnesses have seen him fall. They went uh, up to him to help, but were chased off by German soldiers. They saw that the soldiers searched Gene's pockets, and when the soldiers had found some cigarettes, they smoked them next to the corpse. After that, the soldiers placed the, uh, the corpse on a wheelbarrow under some gunny sacks and brought it inside of one of the barns. Dr. K. Schriep, together with my grandfather, investigated Gene's body that night. And Ben Brink, shocked by the death of his mate, they made a good job and landed safely. The bomb hatch. Although the bomb bay was on fire, the bomb hatch was the only e exit for the crew members in the front. They could enter the bomber through the wheel hatch, but during the flight this was too dangerous for bailing out. Radio operator Elton tried to open the bomb hatch, got stuck with his harness and something and couldn't free himself. Co-pilot Fred came to the rescue and freed him. While El Elton's face and clothing were already burning, Fred opened the hatch and ordered Elton to bail out. This is what Elton wrote about it. I then jumped and reached for my ripcord. But as I had to dove out, I was somersaulting over and over. I, could, I couldn't reach it immediately. I finally grabbed it and gave it a healthy jerk. And then I was jerked roughly to an upright position. The right leg strap had broken and therefore uh, let the chute harness slip up. Uh, till the chest uh, strap caught me in the mouth. Believe me, I really clapped my legs together and slapped my arms uh, to my body and did some hoping that I would not fall through the straps. After Elton, uh, it was Fred's turn to